we throw it away. He brought it to the United States. Hey, everybody. Thank you all for coming. Welcome to our second in our series, If I Knew Then, where we ask early career professionals to talk to uh, more established career professionals about different discipline, about different disciplines in theater. So our first If I Knew Then series, we spoke with playwrights, and tonight we're speaking with actors. Can we not stand in front of you? I can't see them. Um, my name is John Simmons, and I am the director of programs. And again, thank you all for coming. Just a few things um, that we'd like to let you know before we get started. So this is the second in the series. We're going to be doing some more after a couple programs that we have coming up. Um, we hope to speak to arts administrators. We hope to speak to designers and directors next. So look for those coming after April of 2012. In the meantime, the REPA Job Fair, the Regional Entertainment Production Administration Job Fair, is coming up on February. February 18th, that's going to be at the Back Bay Events Center, and that is pretty much for anybody looking at a job outside of acting but working in theater. So you can take a look at our website, and we hope that you will join us for that. So I'd like to just take a moment and introduce the panel, and then we'll get started. DeLong Grant is going to be our moderator for the evening. Oh yeah, Timothy Smith, Will Lyman, and Mariana Basham. What the format of tonight's event is going to be, Delon is going to start off with some questions that we have come up with ahead of time. We'll do that for a little while, and then we're going to open up to audience Q&A. We'll do that for a little bit, and then we will formally end the evening. But you're all welcome to stay and hang out, talk amongst yourselves, and if our guest panelists can stay, you're welcome to talk to them. You can speak with me if you have any questions about stage source, our services, or any resources open to actors in the area. Or you can speak with our stage source board member, Janet Bailey, who probably checked you in when you came in. Uh, thank you all for coming. Enjoy. So we'll get started with, uh, if we can just go down the line and everyone can give me their social security number. <laughs> uh, no, so uh, in, in the spirit of what we're talking about, if I knew then, uh, my first question is, what do you wish you'd known at the beginning of your acting career that you know now? Um, I, I don't have an example of that, but is there anything specific that you think of off the top of your head? Um, uh, in terms of the process of the business, or um, acting, technique, anything like that? Um, you wish you hadn't done it? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I thought, I thought when, when, uh, when I started out, I worked for, I worked for somebody, I'd do a little film, or I'd do a, little, do a play, or do something like this. And I figured, well, there, there's a contact, there's somebody Okay, now we've got a little family thing going along, going on, and you know I'm going to be working for this guy or this woman for, the, you know, off and on for the rest of my life. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it, it does. It didn't. That discovered after several years that that really I'd throw that idea away. It just doesn't doesn't happen. I mean, you hear stories about it, and you hear stories about how it happens for other people, but. It doesn't seem to be the norm by any means. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you can make relations, but uh, uh, it doesn't doesn't guarantee you anything. And that was that was probably the biggest shock to me in the early years of my career. And was that here in Boston? Uh, well, no, because I wasn't working here in Boston in the early okay. years of my career. Okay. <laughs> I think the, the thing that has become kind of most important to me is just being happy with my life outside of the theater. I mean, because I like... Cause How do you do that? ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but I mean, it's, you know, when I just got out of the conservatory and I was all fired up and I thought, I just want to do theater all the time and that will occupy every waking space of my thought. And... It sort of did for a while, but then uh, I, I guess trying to be a more balanced human being is just more important to me now. Yeah, I'm totally happy. I completely agree. That's something that I, I wish I had known that what I thought of as my avocation would become a vocation, and then I needed a new avocation. You know, <laughs> I, I, needed a, I needed a hobby. <laughs> like, what, what am I going to do for fun now that what I did for fun is now my job? You know? 
That's totally true. I'm, ha I'm going through that real big time right now, and I, it's a little scary. Because <laughs> yeah. I've been going pretty hard for a couple of years. <laughs> And I've been really busy, but I don't. I don't know. I got. I need. I need a hug. <laughs> <laughs> you for fun. Well, there's this question of like, what does it add up to? Like, you do all this work and you become an artist, and that's cool. But like, what does that mean? And if you can't answer that for yourself, then then it's more difficult. But if you can turn that into a life, then I think that's more interesting. If that makes sense. Well, that's why I'm enjoying being a part of the community of the Boston, like the Boston theater community is like, uh, most of my friendships have come out of that. I mean, I've been here since graduate school and I've been, I've been in, involved in many different ways in the theater community. So I'm glad that I have that. But yeah, like we were just saying how short the runs of these shows are. So a show happens, it's over, the projects keep keep going away and uh, so like what is what is the yeah you know, what is the through line of my life like over the course of a year and, and uh, you know I'm, I'm still figuring that out <laughs> yeah yeah along, along those lines of, of you were talking about being in, in Boston and how you you started your career, your career with grad school um, how did all of you come to be in Boston and and make a career here for yourself did you come, are you from the Mass area? Did you move to the Mass area? What brought you here and, and what has kept you here? Well, I grew up in Ohio and I went spin. to college with that. You get a little bottle of <laughs> <laughs> just do it. Uh, went to college elsewhere, then I came here for grad school. It was a little bit of an arbitrary decision and then, uh, and that was pretty much out of, right out of college. I took a year off and did a couple of plays. Worked in a bookstore. And then I came here for grad school, did a couple shows, got an agent out of a out of the Brandeis showcase. And I hadn't really planned on moving to New York. I didn't really want to go there, but I got this agent, and I was like, that that's that's my chance. So I moved to New York and I nothing happened for four years. <laughs> and it was really hard. And it's it's like totally my fault because the agent relationship is like totally on you, you've got to like do this stuff like <laughs> that I didn't know anything about. I, I, I just couldn't figure that out, I didn't have anybody to talk to, I didn't play the game right, whatever. And then I kept getting calls from people in Boston to audition, I would come and do shows in Boston. So that happened like four times, and I moved back here. And that was it, that was like, what was that? I don't know, six years ago. That's my story. <laughs> I came. I came to school here in Boston. I I grew up in Vermont, in uh, South Burlington, and uh, you know my choice was to uh, either. I mean, really, the last thing I wanted to do was to go to four years of advanced high school, which is, I think, pretty much word for word what I said at eighteen or seventeen. Uh, I hated school from beginning to end, and I I just wanted to go to some place that. I could engage in something that was uh, uh, active, that had a that had a, uh, uh, a kind of a defined purpose to it, and I chose between music and theater. And, and I applied for early admissions to BU, came down and did my auditions, uh, and I got accepted in early admissions. So in my junior year, that that was done. I was going, but if I didn't do that, I was going to go to UVM uh, and. Uh, you know, for you know, one tenth of the price, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, UVM is a good school, state school. And uh, so I, you know, had established a, a direction by the time I was a junior, although I hadn't really decided, I hadn't made any decisions about becoming an actor. It was just something I, I said, I can, I can see this through for four years. I can do this. I can stay in school and I can do this if I'm doing that. Um, and then uh, and I didn't. I made it through three years. <laughs> and uh, I said, I've got to get out of here. And I, I took, uh, I took, I just left. And the, and the uh, head of the, the theater department called me aside and said, listen, if, if you're leaving, I, I can understand it, but sign a sign, just one little piece of paper says, I'm taking a leave of absence, that way if you want to come back, you ever, I said, I don't want to come back. 
He said, it, 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 if you want to come back, <laughs> you'll be able to. You just call us up and say, I'm coming back. If you don't sign this little piece of paper, then if you, if you change your mind and want to come back, you'll have to reapply. So I said, okay, I signed it. And I went away and I did, uh, I did a, a year of traveling around and doing crazy jobs. And, and then in the course of that year decided that really what I wanted to do was to, was to be an actor. And so I came back to BU, not because I thought that final year would make me an actor, but because I didn't know what the heck else to do, uh, where to start. Uh, so I came back and I've uh, you know, been here pretty much ever since. Uh, we bought a house here in 1974. We moved to New York and came back. And with a with a company that brought us back, <coughs> and, uh, and so we, we stayed on that point. But in 1974, there really wasn't any there wasn't any work you wanted to do here. It was all kind of very very strange. We can talk about that another time. <laughs> <laughs> Some pretty strange companies here. Thank God for that piece of paper. Yeah, I got yeah, to sign it. Came right back. Well, I don't know what I would have done if I had if I I mean I probably wouldn't have felt the loss, except that I would never have met my wife, but, you know, I, which, but I wouldn't have known, would I? <laughs> <laughs> if you knew that. Um, what are you Why am I so miserable? <laughs> <laughs> uh, what happened? Um, yeah, so I, I went to undergrad for something completely different. I went for pre-med and philosophy and got out of there. That was my, it was like, I went through that because it was like watching Channel 2 all the time. It was sort of entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> and I got done with that. And then I, I got out and got a sales job that I actually really enjoyed. But I just started doing shows and I couldn't get away from it. Um, and I told my boss at this industrial safety supply sales company, that wonderful, wonderful company called Masterman's. And, uh, and and they've come to a lot of shows that I, I still do, I was like, whenever that was. Um, but I started doing shows after undergrad, just on my own. And then the artistic director at Worcester Forum Theater that used to exist, this guy Brian Tibnan, who now teaches at Assumption, said you should apply to Trinity Rep. So I applied to Trinity and got in, and I just figured, you know, I didn't really know what I wanted to do, so I just figured if this works out, great. If it doesn't, I'll do something else, be a carpenter or something. And uh, and I got into Trinity, thank God, because uh, that was a, an amazing experience for me. Um, it's a three-year conservatory. Uh, so went through that program, um, moved to New York pretty soon after. Um, and had a pretty good time. Uh, I got this little tour of Greece playing Kaneki. Uh, and when I, that got over, the towers fell. And um, I moved to Chicago. I was out in Chicago for a while. And then I became a carpenter and mostly did carpentry. <laughs> I didn't do much theater. Because uh, I, I sort of, like in my 20s, I had this weird period of and not finding any real value in what I was doing, like the shows that I was doing or the work that I was doing personally. I just couldn't, I didn't get it. I didn't know why I was doing it or how to make it good. It just didn't feel right. So I did carpentry for a while. A while. And um, I applied, uh, I applied, went through the tests and stuff and was accepted into the Chicago uh, Police Academy. And a week before I entered the academy, um, <laughs> the guy who got me into grad school called me up. And I, he must have found out that I was going to do this stupid thing. <laughs> he called me up and said, I, I did competitive judo in Chicago for a while. So I was, I, like, I was hanging out with cops and doing carpentry for cops. I was in that cool, crazy, sick world that is the Chicago Police Department. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> People only know. Um, so, oh, he said I should come back and start the theater company again. 
because they had this wonderful sort of summer Shakespeare company in Worcester, um, and they would do Shakespeare out there. So there was money in an escrow fund tied up with the city. So I, from my crappy office job in Chicago, created the legal entity that was that theater company. Uh, so I worked on it really hard while I was at this other job that I then got fired from. <laughs> and the timing was great. <laughs> so, and I asked them in my exit interview, I guess, I like, did you know that I started another company while I was working at your company? And they're like, no. I was like, yes. <laughs> so I left there. I was a receptionist. <laughs> Who hires me to be a receptionist? <laughs> right? I couldn't, I couldn't shave for two days in a row. <laughs> but, so I left that place. And uh, we came back, started that theater company. The first year was a disaster. Oh, it was so ill-advised. But I had people around me who cared about me and didn't. And where know. was this guy? This was, you know Green Hill Park? Green Hill Park? Green Hill Park in Worcester. No, I live on Greeno Park in Boston, oh, but I don't know Greeno Park, Park, Park in Worcester. Park in Worcester is the, it's the highest point in Worcester. And there's this beautiful 500-seat wooden amphitheater that's built on the side of a hill. Cool. It's gorgeous. Uh, Mel Cobb runs it now. Right. But, so, I started that because I, I played I played cards for years. That was kind of how I supported myself when I got to Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> so I used my poker funds to start this theater company. Like a true cop. <laughs> <laughs> She's writing this down. You know? Yeah, she's writing it down. It's really interesting from the IRS. But what all you guys are saying though is that I feel like you were all here, you left, and then you all came back. Yeah. yeah. That's pretty much that, it. I mean, yeah. and for different reasons, you know, but I feel like uh, you all came back and, and started careers here again. You know, they started here in some capacity, be it school or actually schools, it sounds like you guys all started in school. Yeah. Um, the, 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 I'll, I'll wrap my story up. I, yeah. the, the thing that happened that made it possible for me to have a career in Boston is that I had produced stuff. And for me, it was really important to have control over what I did. And I had never, ever had that before. Like, so I, before, I walk into an audition and I'm like, well, why, like, who am I? You know, what do I do that's special? But then once you've had the experience of selling tickets to your own theater, it's a different experience. You, you view yourself differently, and then people in auditions view you differently. At least that was my experience. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and there's no more crime involved. Other than <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, to just thinking about what you guys do to get work in the Boston area, I know you guys are all well-established actors. Um, you know, I'm sure you audition sometimes. Uh, but I know that a lot of times you're asked to do shows as well. Um, when you're looking for work, when you're actively seeking work, what uh, resources do you, do you utilize? I know state source is a big, um, obviously a, a, a big resource here in town, but is there anything that you specifically do to, to get work in town? I mostly use the equity website, Yeah, honestly. I feel like that's got a pretty Like the national one or the local one? I just go onto the equity website and plug in East. East. Oh, and there's okay. <clears throat> there's the hotline, which is like a, what, what do you call that? The New England Equity Hotline, which I used to call, and it's like somebody. This somebody leaves a message that's about 20 minutes long. <laughs> to hope that and and, and uh, <laughs> I think you have to kind of apply to that. You have to be union, and then you've got a. Like prove that you that you deserve to uh, well, somehow. Like, yeah. So you just have to give your information to Kiffy or whoever the union person doing that, and then you can get emails sent directly. Right. So now you get the emails, which is yeah. better than the, than the twenty minute <laughs> voicemail. Bless her for doing that. <laughs> and uh, that's that. That'll tell you stuff that's like around town and outside of town that I wouldn't that I wouldn't have known about. And um, that's really really helpful. Like I use that. I mean, now, this time of year, there's nothing on there, but in the spring, I just go to all those auditions. Mm -hmm. Audition all over the place. Yeah. I had no idea that existed. Yeah, it's a good thing. Good to know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well. <Love it. laughs> I don't know, I have this.
this amazingly arrogant and smug attitude that if you want me, you'll call me. <laughs> well, if, if you want me, you don't call me. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, and yeah. I don't, I don't, uh, I find it, I find it difficult to do more than three, four shows a year. Right. Um, I, I, I'm in amaze, I'm, I'm amazed by the people around me in this community that work, you know, go from one show to, to another. I, I did that you know, in a couple of different seasons, you know, uh, may, well, maybe five shows, which not even, doesn't even qualify in some people's lexicon. Uh, and I, I was just like reeling from it. I, 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 I couldn't do it. Um, it takes me, <laughs> it takes this gray head longer to prepare and uh, than it used to, uh, for certain, for sure. Um, and I just, you know, so the, the, the fact that I, I only look to do a fewer number of shows a year, uh, if I do, I'm, I'm happy if I do two or three. And uh, so that means that I, I'm, I have a much better chance of being asked to do things uh, there are there are times when I mean I auditioned for uh, uh, all my sons at the Huntington uh, uh, that I, you know I'm sitting at home saying well, why haven't they called me <laughs> maybe I should give them a call and say think I could audition for this and uh, so I auditioned for that um, so it, it does it does happen I actually do. <laughs> Um, um, but I, so using resources, uh, I, I support the resources, but I don't use them very much. Mm -hmm. um, just to go back to what you were saying about um, how long it takes you to prepare, uh, something that I, that I find interesting is that I feel like we put so much effort and time into not only shaping our craft and, and, and uh, auditioning and making contacts and, and utilizing resources, um, but it's hard to reconcile that with the amount of work that you actually get to do, the amount of performance you get to do. Um, how did you do that or how do you do that? So let me rephrase the question. How do you reconcile all the work that you put into auditioning and all that stuff with the amount of delivery that you get, with the amount of stage time you get? Um, I feel like it's a really big, for me anyway, it, it's a challenge to really work so hard and then you know, not book job after job, or get a, a job here and a job there. Is that a clear question? Everyone was confused. Yeah, <laughs> no, no, I think yeah, it's a good question. I, I uh, Tim said approached it earlier, and that and that you really you, you have to enjoy the whole process of what you're doing. Yeah. Um, preparation to me is the same as working. Um, whether it whether it whether you end up booking a job or not, uh, the, if, if you, I mean, you have to enjoy the, the, the process of uh, exploration <coughs> on your own as much as you enjoy the, the process of exploration with other people in the room. Yeah, if you don't um, enjoy sitting down yeah. and learning a monologue, then you're yeah. in trouble. You know, if you, yeah, it's real. And, and it, you, come, come. We, we 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 take we take parts and we and 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 we study them <clears throat> even with no prospect of work uh, uh, just to just to keep working. I mean, and that's the thing. I used to think that that uh, you know it'd be great to be a painter or a writer because you can work without getting hired. Um, but so can we. We, we can do a lot of work without getting hired. We can we can prepare for uh, we can prepare a role. We can study a role. And I and I and from the reading I've done, I, th I think this used to be a lot more common in in in, uh, in the previous century, especially the early part of the previous century, in the in the in the uh, in the English theater, particularly where young actors would just take a role and they'd learn the role. It learned the role. No, no prospect of doing it, or you know, anybody's prospect of doing it. Uh, and uh, you know, I, 
I, I did that with Hamlet when I was, you know, 20, 25. I, I could have stepped into it. I've never done it, but I, I, you know, I pretty much know the thing or did then. Yeah. Um, but you work. You and and you enjoy that. You enjoy that process of unfolding a script and unfolding those moments. And you can do that on your a, a lot of it on your own. You know what what remains is you know what what the rest of the people in the room bring and what how that shapes a performance. Even that we don't get so much anymore because it's so much so many decisions have made been made before we even step into the room. Mm -hmm. But. Um, uh, that's a whole different subject. Uh, so I think I think that there's, there's you maintain you maintain your focus by continuing to do your work. You you, you have it you have an opportunity to, to go in and read five minutes from something, and you do as much work as you have as you as you can on it, and you enjoy doing that work. And you go in and you do those you know that little section out of this body of work that you've done, and maybe you impress somebody. It really, you know, it's, um, in the in the great scheme of things, it doesn't matter whether you impress them or not, because you you've done your work. Mm -hmm. Finding the joy in finding. If, and, and if, doing if, the work. There's, if there's no joy in doing the, in doing the work, but you know, it doesn't make, make any difference whether you're hired or not. Right. And you Nobody just, won't watch you anyway. And you're just punching a time clock. And you're just yeah. working for hire, and working for money. Right. That's not what we do here. Right. It's great if you can like an uh, if you can like auditioning, which I finally started doing. I mean, because it's an opportunity to play that part for a little bit, yeah. and um, and uh, and you know. I still I still go to auditions all the time where I have to do a couple of monologues and I used to do these monologues that were like uh, uh, you know, like crying, losing my shit, and then I was like, wait a minute, I don't have to do that and they don't want to see that anyway. <laughs> so then I found a couple of monologues that are just really fun to do. Like one of them's com but they're, they're both kind of comedy and one of them's dark but funny. It's like why then every time I get to do those I get really psyched. So that's really helpful. And it was, and it's a lot easier and more fun for everyone. Especially <laughs> <laughs> yeah. for the film roles where you, you know, the, you, you, you do it in Medea. <laughs> and they say, well, well, you're the role we're looking at for you. You sell the newspaper. To the <laughs> oh, can I have a candy bar with that? <laughs> well, you're bringing up another question, you guys. When you uh, Finding the joy in doing the work, um, but what about finding the joy in finding the work? Um, so actually looking for the jobs, uh, searching for auditions, uh, having a survival job. I feel like that's the grueling part of acting, right? Survival job. Um, that's that the, the actual doing of the job. I feel like is is the the grueling, difficult part. How do you find joy in that? Is that a really the deep question? <laughs> <laughs> you need a survival job that you enjoy. Like you have to have a passion in your life that's that's you know if you're going to do something that sucks all your energy out so that you can't do the thing that you love, that's a trap. You know, mm -hmm. totally. I mean, yeah. if that's what you got to do to live, then that's what you got to do. But yeah. But I mean, the same job could be that way. It could be totally different for two different people. I mean, some people can, some people can support themselves in their acting professions by teaching, and other people. Uh, I, I taught a semester at RISD, and it just about killed me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I was like, I don't know how anybody does this. <laughs> this is exhausting. I had a, a, a funny conversation with Dale Place, and I was just talking about Dale. Yeah. Was just, mm -hmm. He was like, Tim, keep your overhead low. <laughs> keep your overhead really low. Mm -hmm. You're going to be an actor, you can't expect a lot from it financially, generally. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. that's how I've, you know, that and cards. <laughs> <laughs> My wife and I did a film about a, a photographer in, in uh, New Orleans. And that was one of the things, one of the things he said, it came to kind of, it came, became a kind of byline of the film of, uh, of, of a life, 
he lived a life that was small enough that he could live big inside of it. Wow. That's awesome. So just to, to shift the conversation a little bit, um, I think of all of us, Will probably has the most experience in terms of just acting and acting in Boston and so on and so forth. But in, so I guess, uh, <laughs> uh, for Will specifically, but I, I really want to know what everyone thinks in terms of what you feel has changed in theater or is currently changing in theater. Um, uh, or in Boston, in, in the community, uh, I'll give an example. Uh, you guys were talking about the short runs of shows, how there's a lot of turnover in terms of like a season and how many shows you do. Um, and that sparked my, uh, this conversation I was having with Spiro uh, Boludos <coughs> at the Lyric about rehearsal. Um, all the shows that I'm doing now have two and a half weeks of rehearsal. <laughs> it's like, in, and I, you know, I remember in undergrad you would have like, a month and a half, two months of rehearsal wow. for a weekend of performances. But now they're like, you know, six weeks of performances, four weeks of performances, with two and a half weeks of rehearsal, it's incre incredible. Especially when you're trying to do like a musical or, or anything, you know? Um, so for me, that's one of the things that I don't feel like is changing for the better. <laughs> um, but is there anything along those lines that you guys see changing theater for that's exciting, that, that, that isn't exciting? Did the lyric used to be three weeks? It used I to be, like was, everybody used to be four and four. Yeah, it was like four yeah. something. The spirit was saying. That was the yeah. standard. Four and four was the standard. Yeah. yeah. And then it became three and four, then it became three and three, and then it's like two and a half, and three or four. Uh, it's just I, it's yeah, absurd. I worked at Speak, last time I worked at Speak Easy, they're like, it's really great here because we have, th we have three weeks. And I was like, <laughs> what happened? I, don't, I mean, even when I started out, we were rehearsing three weeks everywhere and, and like that's one of their that's one of their things that they've got on other people I was like wow it's totally true because I think new rep is two weeks yeah. and those black box shows ten days mm -hmm. and if it's, it's like a full-length black box shows and there's like maybe two one to three people in those shows <laughs> and it's like so you're like doing this enormous piece of work in ten days and you're long. doing and you're once again you're doing <coughs> it on your own if you don't come in pretty much Knowing what you're doing and knowing, and and yeah. being off book, you're ten days of rehearsal. Right. <laughs> you're dead. You're dead. And that and it's it's true even with a even with a lot of uh, three and four week rehearsals. We got you know they, when we first started talking about doing long days journey at the new rep, they were talking about three weeks of rehearsal. I said, I'm not doing it. <laughs> three. Yeah. I know they, they, you know, upped it to four, um, um, but even so, you, you know, something like that, you're working on it for a year in advance, on your own, mm -hmm. unpaid. Mm -hmm. uh, but you love but, it. But you love it. <laughs> you know, just because I love it doesn't mean I shouldn't get paid That's for it. Oh, that's <laughs> I mean, when Bob and Ann did did uh, Frankie and Johnny, they you know they they did it in I think a, a two and a half three week rehearsal period, but they they've been working <coughs> even with that time. Yeah. Nobody's supposed to know this, you know. But, uh, but you do though. Yeah, working it for for months before that. Mm -hmm. yeah. So they brought all of this, and it, it, this is a the uh, the last economic downturn did a real. Uh, it did a lot of damage to the theater community, uh, and it because that's when that's when we started going to three weeks and two and a half weeks and, and uh, cutting the lengths of the run, which I don't understand. I mean, that's your money maker, right? Yeah. You know, that's the only chance you have of recouping anything, unless you're you know pumping your your bag to your to your board and your supporters, um, but. And I, I don't think it's coming back. I don't think it's coming coming back without without a real change in, in thinking <clears throat> about how you know how we rehearse and perform theater in this country. Um, first of all, I mean, we have a, we have a we have a uh, tradition of educating our audiences, miseducating our audiences to try to appreciate under-rehearsed, under-performed theater to begin with. Um, 
and it's it's so quick and so fast and down and dirty that a lot of a lot of what we see is kind of a recycled television style performance uh, that you know we all everybody in this room recognizes immediately and we go uh, and and even the people that don't recognize it are wondering why they're why they paid sixty dollars for something that's sort of about kind of like sitting at home and watching television, <laughs> and uh, mm. so we're 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 doing a disservice to the theater. We're doing a dis disservice to to the way the American public thinks about the theater, what they what they think the theater is good for and useful for and, and thrilling. What what's thrilling about theater? And uh, you know, I, I it's it's. Going to change. It's going to take a, a major change in the way we think about things. Uh, I think it's going to take changes in the way we, the way, uh, the equity contracts work. Uh, it's something that we're struggling with at, uh, at uh, Commonwealth Shakespeare Company, where we're you know, trying to figure out how to how to manage this, this new uh, kind of a new direction. Um, one of the things that I'm seeing is that we're going to have to go to down to the equity office and say, uh, we need to, not just for us, not just for our theater company, but as a theater community and as uh, some people who belong to this, to this union and people who are also producing and still may belong to the union, need to talk about how this process is, how, how this process happens. And what we need to do in our contracts to allow it to happen in a in a in a a more relaxed, less frenzied, less less desperate situation than we find ourselves in every, the first day we walk into rehearsal. With you know, here's the design. It's been done. Here's the stage you're going to stand on. Here are the costumes you're going to wear. Here's what this play is about. Blah blah blah. And we're, and, and all these actors are walking in going. Oh, okay. You know, and it you know it doesn't take much to turn off creativity. And mm -hmm. um, one of the fastest ways to do it is to, <laughs> is to tell you tell you what your creativity is about. And so we never we never get a chance to to sit down with just the words. You know, six actors in a room with a bunch of words, mm -hmm. yeah. and say, what does it mean here? What does it mean when I say these words to you? Is it different from when I say these words to you? Mm -hmm. you know, if you were in that role, well, of course it is. So, but this is the this these are the people that are doing this. Mm -hmm. So, this is where this play lives. Mm -hmm. So, let's build it from here rather than build it from here in somebody's mm -hmm. mind because they have to in order to get you know their budgets in and their you know everything done and 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 the sets built by opening night and all the rest of it. It's just, just that's one of the reasons I mostly just do musicals. Wow. Because I feel like like a, mute, like a bunch of people who do musical theater are, can easily sort of become a machine to, like, to churn out a show. And there's something about it that it, it it's still not, I mean, it's not right. Like, it's still not right that you have to do a full musical in two and a half weeks. But the last... You know, when I had to do a Sam Shepard play in ten days, I was like, "This is the last. I can't." Yeah. It's insulting. It's insulting to the playwright. Mm -hmm. So, not that it's not insulting to people who write musicals, but you're right. I don't know. Musical it's theater is it's it. so much more calculating. There's like a a, a, a formula. There's a well, clear formula. Yeah. I have to sing this note at this moment. Yeah. And then it, we cut off together, the dance stops there, and bam, jazz hands, you know? Um, it's just, it's a little no, more, no, I'm not saying no. it's right, I'm not saying no, it's right, right, but it's clear, right? But I, I, there's just something that's so horrifying to me when you can't do table work on something like Sam Shepard and Arlene Neal. Yeah. It kills me. One thing that, I, uh, it, it kind of changes, like, like you were saying, um, Will, your thinking, right? In terms of how you're able to do the work, you have to think about it in a cerebral way, um, and it, it, the organicness of what you're doing kind of isn't able to really develop. I find that there's a lot of times where we're two weeks into a run, and I'm like, oh, 
That's what that line means. Okay. <laughs> I get it. You know what I mean? Because you're worried about everything else. You know, you, you rehearse for a week, you put on your costume the second week, and then you open, you have an audience and previews after like, you know, literally two weeks. It's insane. Um, but you have to adapt with those times, right? Um, and, and evolve and, and try to make it all work. Um, something that I guess I, I think I struggle with is how to continue to um, develop within that and, and grow, grow who I am and, and who I am as a performer. Um, how do you guys continue to, to grow who you are and, and um, stay fresh and relevant in terms of the craft? It's hard not to stay fresh on the run of a show when you are really not learning. You don't know what's maybe going on with certain things about your performance or, or the play until you close. Uh, you know, <laughs> half my lines mean until I'm in the shower after the show is over. So I, I like the when I, once a sh once a show is open, I try not to panic about the fact that there's an audience and try to. I really I think I'm getting better at that. It's just it's kind of hard that the press comes after two days. <laughs> what are you gonna do? But. Uh, <laughs> But, you know, like, so, I just let it be, like, it's, it's just always going to, I just kind of realized it's always going to be in progress through the end. And not to, not to panic about that, but figure out a way to enjoy that. Mm -hmm. I think that's, I think that's an okay way to be. Mm -hmm. It's true. Uh, it, it, it's, it's a, it's a living thing. And it, it uh, but I think one of the, one of the things that, that, we don't get as, I didn't get it in any training that I had, and I don't see it a lot in, in a lot of the companies that I'm working in, is that they're, they're, they're really kind of, you want, I always rail against the, 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 the equity rule, you shall maintain your performance as directed. Yeah. I, you know, I look at it on the list. Every t in oh, post it's real. It's a real thing. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you never read that. You never read that. You know, so I don't, I don't think I check them out. They're pretty, pretty disturbing. No, I mean, <laughs> many uh, of the rules are great, but, <laughs> but, that, but that is that is it's an equity uh, thing that's posted on backstage. It says, I don't know what it is. Number eight. You you shall re you know maintain your performance as directed. You shall wear your costume, the, the, the costume that's given you, you shall arrive on time, you won't be drunk, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. um, but you shall maintain your performance as directed. Now, the director leaves on opening night. Mm -hmm. Now, if you have had four weeks of previews, I'm a little more okay with that. <laughs> if you've had two previews, I'm not so okay with that. Yeah. And, and I think many of us kind of disregard that and say, I'm still learning. I'm still learning how to tell this story. I'm still learning how, you know, what's important and what isn't important. I once characterized the rehearsal process as being a gathering of crutches, uh, where we, you know, we're so insecure about what we're doing that we, you know, we say, I gotta have the, I gotta, you know, I gotta have, I gotta have the eye patch, or I gotta have the pipe, or I gotta have the, you know, I gotta, I gotta, <laughs> come on, I gotta do this, and there's gotta be something on the desk there that I go over and pick up and, you know, busy myself with, because we don't know what we're doing, and we want something that we can hold on to. Mm. But once you know what you're doing, you, know, you don't need that anymore. You don't need the pipe or the eye patch or the thing on the desk that, you know, that you can busy yourself with because you're busy with what you're actually doing. And when you learn that, then you, you start throwing away your crutches, you know. And, and a lot of that doesn't happen until you've told the story in front of an audience for mm -hmm. several times, sometimes a couple, three, four weeks, which is all we ever get. And, and at the end of four weeks, you've all experienced it, you know, I think we're ready to open now. <laughs> I think we learned how to tell this story, you know? Yeah. And, and uh, so it's, it's really absurd, this idea that, you know, 
a director has implanted uh, uh, a, a concept on this thing, and this is, and he's directed you in what to do, and you won't, that you shall not change it after uh, after opening night when he's no longer there. No matter what you learn, mm -hmm. you're not supposed to change it. The rule isn't strictly enforced. I'm happy to say. But it's it just sticks in my craw because it's a constant process. But I think what I was sorry, just like, well, hell, hell, hell. Uh, what uh, what it started out saying is that we we see in our community actors who 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 know how to continue working and actors who are unfamiliar with how to continue working on their own and. Seems to be that the rule was written for because we fear the actors who don't know how to continue to work on their own and start developing little side bits and things that, that are just you know more crutches, you know, uh, more amusements, you know, rather than digging in uh, to a role and simplifying and throwing away crap that you don't need so that the story becomes crystal clear. I once had an, at, an acting teacher, um, well, my voice and speech teacher in undergrad, um, for two years I would get up to do a, a piece and she would always be like, Delando, go to the trick store. And I was like, what the hell is a trick store? <laughs> but it was like all of my crutches. It was all of like the, the little things that I did that I thought was acting, you know, that didn't allow me to express whatever the exercise was that we were expressing. Um, so that was a, a pivotal moment for me in my acting uh, education. Give me something that you learned in terms of acting technique, uh, something you read, something you know, an experience by a teacher that that has been really, really pivotal to your um, career and development. I think working with Fred Solomon, uh, because it and it sort of applies to what we were just talking about, and you know, like, because you give you can give a, a director an ulcer if if you. If you, because you can't just, you can't just trust that somebody else is going to come in and make a performance good for you. And I always had a lot of respect for Fred, and that no matter what, like no matter no matter what he was given for direction, he work he worked so hard on his own to make his performance good. Isn't that called director proof? <laughs> sort of, I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, and, I, and, I, and I find myself, I just had a conversation with a very good director who just didn't, who you have, you make relationships with, with directors that you work with over and over again, and, and they understand how you work, and if somebody doesn't know that you'll be okay, they, a lot of times directors will sort of go with the lowest common denominator of what they think you're capable of, and and that can be scary, and then you have to sort of, man, you know, maneuver around that. I mean, Fred sometimes brings a machine gun to a knife fight. <laughs> but, so I try not to do that, but a, a lot of, a, there's some antagonism there between actors and directors, and you have to be comfortable in that. You have to be willing to stand up for what, you know, to be aggressive and be able to stand up for what it is that you think needs to happen. But at the same time, know what you're going too far. <laughs> I've done that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Well, but I, I'll spit out a couple of things that famous people have said that I really like. Yeah. What, uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman, who says, always do your best work all the time, everywhere, because you don't know who's watching. Mm -hmm. Right? So you can't just like... It's a matinee. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Reminds me. Anyway, <laughs> just did a bad. It was, I just did a bad day with somebody who who was like who just decided that it was just that fuck this matinee, and they and they, they went so fast that I, that, every, that, that, that there was no time for people's quick changes. People were backstage like trying to do a quick change, which you know we've got like a nine second quick change. To, you, you need all those nine seconds. <laughs> <laughs> so it was so fast that like the people were not even making their entrances. <laughs> what are you gonna do?
Um, so don't do that. What, what is Tom Hanks says, make it about the other person. Mm -hmm. I like that piece of advice. Not that I always do it, but I try to think about it. That's, that, I mean, that's always great advice. That's I mean, it's not, it's, you know, you just put your attention outside yourself. Put your attention on the other person. It's all about what that person needs. Figure it out. Yeah. I was just doing a scene with somebody and but the scene wasn't working, the scene wasn't working, and we were both like, why the hell is the scene not working? And then I was like, we're not in the same scene. <laughs> you are playing, I'm playing my scene for me, and you're playing your scene for you. Because you're working so and hard to be like, awesome. If I, I like, you know, I'm going to let my scene go. <laughs> you know? And then we can like, we can do your scene and then we're on the same page, you know? Totally. And then it works, you know? Totally. It, oh, and, it, and it's supposed to be funny, and I was like, why is this not working? You know? It's so crazy. Most problems can be solved by that. Yeah. Being in the same play. It helps mm. sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so back to uh, another practical question. Um, so uh, do you have any strategies for uh, the financial business part of acting? Um, how do you hold it together? Um, don't buy it. Are you able to piece a living, piece a living together? Specific, give me specific strategies. Don't buy anything. Don't, don't eat. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. It's a hard one. Yeah, it's a hard one. Because it is. Paycheck to paycheck, it's rusting. If you're living it that way. Um, I'm not living it that way. <laughs> yeah, my strategy was to make as much money as I could doing voiceover and narration work. And, you know, it, it worked out for me. So, you know, it's, uh, without that, I don't know, uh, I don't know what I'd be doing. I don't know, I had no idea, because I'm not really equipped to do anything else. <laughs> and I uh, don't really have the desire to do anything else. Um, so, um, it worked out pretty good. Um, I, I don't know, you have to, you have to have, you have to have a day job because you're not going to support a family on the theater wage. Yeah, there's no, I don't know, anybody who, it's just not possible. Not Nobody, everybody I know has two or three jobs. And, <laughs> and, it, and unfortunately it has to be a job that you kind of have uh, control over about hours and, you know, when you work and when you require to work or where you have to be. Um, I recommend the voiceover business <laughs> very highly. It's a great, it's a great way to do it if you can. I mean, it's a tough. It's, it's Tell us tough. all how to get in. It's tough. <laughs> give us, give us, <laughs> give us two steps. Will, how do we get into the voiceover business? Steal his frontline gig. Got it. <laughs> yeah. Get, you, well get yourself a well-paying job. That's yeah. the end. It's like, you know, yeah. it's like, like Gina Davis says, uh, how to become a famous actress. Get yourself cast in. Uh, Six top grossing pictures in a row. How do you make bread out of dirt? <laughs> do that. <laughs> you can that. Make it that. You get it. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this. Is, this a, is, is most of your work out of New York and LA, or is any of it here? It's almost all out of, uh, well, except for Frontline, which is here right. and has been here for 30 years. I've been doing, you know, Frontline for, since season two, uh, which not only has provided me with an income, but it has provided me with uh, a, a feeling that I was doing something worthwhile for, for 29 years um, through the many periods of, of my life when I was doing nothing that seemed to be worthwhile, you know, doing stupid movies or stupid television or you know, stupider plays, uh, you know, and like feeling like what? Why am I doing this? Is nothing makes any sense? Nothing is nothing is is important to anybody. Nothing is moving anybody. Nothing is. Is, uh, has anything to say to anybody's life, but there was always frontline, which, which I felt had 
something important to say and was and was an important part of the of the cultural landscape and certainly a, an important part of the uh, of the journalistic landscape. So I was a part of that. I was a small part of it. I'm not you know I just I just read you know I don't do the research. I don't do I'm not a journalist. Um, but I was I was a part of that. I am a part of that, and that's that has provided me with a great deal, not only a, a, a certain financial security, or part of a financial security, but picture, but, uh, most, but more importantly, I really think in terms of the way I have felt about myself as a contributing member of, of society, uh, which is which was very important. Uh, other than that, uh, for the last probably uh, 15 years, most of the work has come from places other than Boston. Uh, it's, it's kind of, you move, it, you can make a very good living in a, in a local market uh, doing local spots, you know, the bank spots, the car spots, the, you know, the, the local McDonald's, the local newspapers, the, you know. Um, uh, the local outlets, Suffolk Downs, and on and on and on. You can make a good living doing that. Uh, if you break into uh, the next tier, then you have a national market and you need to stay out of the local markets because there's uh, this little thing called exclusivity with, with uh, 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 television commercial. Uh, that says if you're doing if you're doing a, a Ernie Box uh, auto dealership, if you're Ernie Box Toyota, you can't do the Ford F-150 uh, national commercial because you're using your, your rival uh, product in a in this teeny little market that pays you you know a minuscule amount, a good amount, but a minuscule amount in terms of what the national Ford product is going to pay. So, uh, if you make that leap, then you have to decide. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to let all the local market go, so that I can be available to do the national market. And that's you know that's a that's a decision that you that you may be blessed to having to make sometime. Um, from your lips. So, <laughs> huh? Is it from your lips? Yeah, indeed, uh, indeed. But it, but that so no no not much local market work. I sometimes do uh, a, a hospital spot for, you know, some place out in Omaha or, you know, because uh, there's not much likelihood of having a conflict there. Or, and radio spots are free to do anywhere because oh. there's no exclusivity in radio. Cool. I think we're going to open it up to audience questions at this point. Um, so, <coughs> does anybody have a question at all for anyone? Yes. Uh, how do you get over, when, when do you still get nervous at auditions and how do you overcome it? I know you said a little about doing something you like, is there any other things when you just like, the more you want something, the more nervous you get and so you screw it up. Oh, it, it's hard, like, I, I, I finally came to the realization that the more I want something, the less, the fewer, I don't make as many choices, because you don't want it, you're like, I'll just be... I don't want to make the wrong choice, so I don't make any choice. I'll just do something that, like, you know, hopefully they can just imprint what they want to see on what I just, like, I mean, I try not to do that anymore. You just have to make, a, make, make your choices and do them and feel good about them, and they might not be what they wanted. So it's, there's a little bit of a risk there, but you, nothing's going to happen if you walk in there and do nothing. So that's, that's interesting. I, I went through a period of, uh, I think maybe a lot of actors go through a period at some point in their career where they're just absolutely terror struck. Um, and uh, I, I went through this uh, about five years ago for a period of about three years and I just like you know, couldn't force myself to get on stage, you know. And, I would stand backstage and I'd, you know, I'd be saying all my lines and I was just uh, absolutely a mess. And uh, uh, the, way I, the way I got out of that 
or I found my way out of that, was to say, all you have to do is to remember the first thing. The first thing. Yeah. So true. Just yeah, remember the first thing. It's so true. What are you going on stage to do? You're going on stage to, I'm looking for my keys. I'm going to go find my keys. I think they're in that room over there. I'm going to go get my keys. Oh, there's somebody else here. Somebody <laughs> says something to me. And, and you do the next step. You take it one step at a time. Yeah. Um, and if you, if you really concentrate on that, I don't have to do the entire journey. I don't have to be prepared to do the entire, to, to do the entire long day's journey in tonight when I step on the stage for the first time. All I have to do is, is try to make my life feel good. You know, um, I can do that. I know that. I can do that. And then it becomes something else. And that's all you have to concentrate on. You don't have to do the whole thing. You don't have to be prepared to do the whole thing. And, and, and at that point I began to try to empty myself as I'm standing behind the door backstage. To empty myself of expectation of anything other than what I need to do right now. First thing, just you know, yeah. and and that begins to that you find all oh, the nerves start to slip away at that point, and and you're not filled with this anxiety of am I going to be able to get through to the end without fucking up, mm -hmm. um, and uh, so that was that was the journey through that. It took a long time. Cheat sheets are good too. No shame. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's two sheets. backstage, yeah. you know, especially in the beginning of a run, you're like, oh, yeah. my next scene, next entrance, so what am I wearing? <laughs> Tighten it up. Tape it up backstage. It's just, yeah. that's what you do. Yeah. Should it stick flat? <laughs> yeah, right. Last show I did, we were all back. We do a scene, run backstage. Everyone is just in a book. Like, what's, yeah. What is, oh. Like crazy, just yeah. crazy. But yeah, you got you don't have time. But you just lucky I'm out there really saying the right thing and talking to people. <laughs> I know you'd asked about auditions. Yeah, specifically yeah. auditions. But uh, and that it's, is, it's really bad. Like I find myself doing the same thing. Like I'll try to think of something else because there's that t there's that need to want to run things over in your head fifteen right. times for you can Like I want to explain that. Yeah. I'm not going to well, now. There's a real danger in it because if yeah. you if you're you running through, through it backstage and you forget it. Yeah. You yeah. panic. Yeah. <laughs> you know, as far as don't don't give yourself the opportunity to forget my <laughs> But as far as like the audition thing, um, fear of failure is the is the worst. I think it's the the worst. I think it's a sin. Like you have to be willing to fail. Yeah. You have to sort of look for that. Like, I love those chances when you can fail, mm -hmm. you know, because if, if there are chances in there, then what's the point, like, you know, like find out whatever it is for you to make it so that you can give yourself that permission to go on and fail, and then you'll do something really cool. And the goals, like, you know, another thing that's good to learn is like, I can't go get that job. My goal can't be to get this job. It, you know, it's got to be something worth that I could actually measure or achieve. So it's like I can go and listen to the reader and make sure I thank them and not black out. I can uh, work on. We <laughs> have do that all the time, blacking out, like totally ridiculous. Try to act like a normal person in the audition and not like like you can just give yourself specific things where you can walk out and be like, did I did I do what I wanted to do today about with my preparation or with listening or. Physically, was I doing what I worked on? And so, and also, like, try to, you know, there's a difference between, like, if you go in for a film audition, they just hand you, like, you know, here's your paper, governor, whatever. Like, then you can't really prepare and they don't want you to, anyways. But, like, if you've got a couple pages of sides, just try to have a lot of fun and love working on that and getting to play that part. And what do you love about that person? What do you want to do with her? It's really, that's what you can do. Yeah, you have, like, there was this thing that they drilled into us when, when I did judo in Chicago. It was execution versus results. Mm -hmm. Like, 
you can execute, you know you can execute. You can try, you can do the thing that you know that you can do, but you will never ever be able to control the results. So, yeah, you only have control. Somebody told me in under, undergrad, what's the best piece of advice? You only have control over so much mm -hmm. in the room. Like all you can do is what you can do. The decision is up to them, so let it go. I hate auditioning. I detest auditioning. Um, because I, I can't get over the idea that it's in someone's opportunity to judge me. And that's my, that's my con continued battle. It's not about them judging me, it's about, like you guys are saying, going in and just doing the work that I'm prepared, I prepared myself to do. Um, but I, that's the, the leap that I can't make, that I have nine people at a table, not so much in Boston, but in New York. I hate auditioning in New York, you have like nine people behind a table, mm -hmm. and they're all there, and it's just you to do a monologue, do a scene, do a song, um, two minutes, thank you, goodbye, you know? And then you're like, you spend the entire day being like, oh shit, like, what that? I should have, oh, it was, that was flat. Oh, you know what I mean? Um, mm -hmm. The end. Well, I've had opportunities to, like, the, uh, you learn so fast, so much when you get to sit in on auditions or, like, be a reader or, mm -hmm. you know, be participating in some way in the auditions and you see a bunch of people come in and read the same thing. So I've learned, that's where I've learned the stuff, well, it's part of where I learned the stuff about, like, come in, relax, act like, like a normal person, you know, without, you know, you can just sort of tell when, when, when it's like, I really want this job. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it's like, hello, nice to see you, thank you. Like, totally normal behavior, you know? <laughs> and then, like, start freaking out about, like, how much you love the play, and, like, <laughs> that's all you really do. It's like, and then, you know, people who, if, if they're totally wrong, but they've just made some interesting choices. It's clear that they like have, are intelligent and made some cool choices with, with whatever they're doing. Then they're they're gonna leave and they're, you know the table's gonna go. Oh, well, that person's really cool. Maybe we'll call them in another time. Like that's really all you can do. Has anybody here actually sat in and been an auditioner? Well, no. <laughs> Many times. I know, I, I know, but I don't want. That. I don't want. I've read about it. I don't want to be on that side of the table. Oh, it's it's very I, very. It's, it's cause, cause it every really person, is. Because I, I know because every person who comes in, they're like, oh, I hope this is the person. I hope this is the person. I do. You, know? you you understand why? I mean, because you can tell some. Somebody opens the door, takes two steps in the room. Mm -hmm. You don't know. Two seconds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. And it and it. it so it's it's very instructive. If you ever get a chance to do it, I recommend it. <laughs> Judgment. <laughs> well, but that's what you will experience experience it for yourself, and that's very valuable. Absolutely. You'll see, uh, you know, somebody opens their mouth. They're like, "Thank you." Yeah. And that you see where that comes from. And you, you know, obviously, if you're a nice person and you've been on the other side of the room as well, you you don't say. Thank you. Next, uh, you thank them. Thank people for coming in. Be polite and be a normal human being uh, yes. on, on your side of the table too. But, uh, it's uh, you, you'll learn a lot about your own auditioning techniques. Didn't yeah. you find? When, yeah. Well, it's interesting and not have the nervousness. Yeah. In other words, to watch someone else do, go through the process and you're not feeling that I'm next. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sense of I'm next, but being able to be completely away from the situation and, and evaluate it and say, why, why did that work? Why is what they're doing not working? And then being able to know, is that something that I'm doing? And relating to it constantly for yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the other thing from watching it was to see those who were, I could see were really talented, but were even more nervous than I get. You know, and like, I you know a lot of people can't see through that nervousness. Um, and you see someone like screwing up their stuff, not doing it. Uh, but they, you, you know they've got something, but they're so nervous that they clam up. Mm -hmm. uh, especially at, say, the stage source when they're doing it for like 20, 30 people and it could cost them a season if they screw up. Because it can. You know, if you do a really bad, if you do a really good stage source audition, especially non-union, but, but union too, it can mean the difference of being in either zero or being called and asked to audition or being even asked to be in like five different shows. It's a big, big pressure, especially now when, um, like this year, all the auditions are going to be in April, and uh, I think, especially for the union, they're going to cost everything from, the, you know, like, 
either at Stage Source or with their April, April, May auditions, like last year, you had days where you had three auditions in one day. So if that was the day that you were under the weather or had a bad voice or weren't feeling confident, you couldn't do well. And although you only had that one day here in Boston to see be seen by three different theater companies. Mm -hmm. I think that's what, when going back to what they were talking about with that control, right? Uh, change the stakes. You know, mm -hmm. the stakes aren't with, the stakes shouldn't be with what they're doing, it should be with what you're able to do at that moment, mm -hmm. you know. Um, what were you going to say? There's also another a, a very technical thing, uh, and that is that if you take, if you take a sip of water, it, it redirects the attention of your body to <laughs> that, <laughs> swallowing that, and, and even if you take a, you know, something mild like a lemon drop or something, mm -hmm. and spend some time tasting the lemon drop and, and swallowing the juices from it and, and feeling that lemon drop in your body, it redirects the attention of your body away from the, the sweats and the, and the shakes and the terrors. Uh, a small thing, but it, it, it yeah. can work. No, but that's that's the kind of, that's very helpful. That's mm -hmm. because I think there are some people who that's their big thing that stops them doing their best work of, above uh, everything else. I'm not recommending uh, three musketeers or. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, something that's that's They're why mild. that's why the uh, uh, that go goes back to what I was saying before about the for something like stage source. Make sure that you like your pieces and that yeah. they feel yeah. right to you. Like then, then you, I mean. You do yourself a huge favor right there. Yeah. Want to do? You yeah. Really want something to do you like? Because I did pieces for a while that I, that you know, somebody picked out for me. They thought was right, and, and again, they were like really heavy and stuff, and that wasn't helping me. It was just like, oh my God, I wonder if I'm going to have to, to like do this monologue today. And I shouldn't have to worry about that. But what if you prefer those to comedies? Well, then you're in great shape. <laughs> <laughs> whatever, whatever you want to do. But I, I sometimes think this this town likes comedies better. Uh, for the world lets comedy better. Yeah. No, no, but when you watch them for an audition, it's probably better to have a, at least one piece that should be definitely be a comedy anyway. And I've always been told in an audition it's better to do comedy yeah. than to do a drama. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I, comedies I find for me more difficult. But it's harder, yeah. Just emoting, you know. Um, that makes sense. A any other questions? Do you have any other questions? You were talking about sort of changing, uh, changing the focus of some of your audition pieces. How did you find your new ones? What was your? Did you just read a shitload of plays? What was the? One of them was from one of them actually. I took a class in New York, and a guy helped me. The teacher helped me mm -hmm. pick this one out, that, and I thought it was really fun. Um, and then another one is from a show that I had done, and and in fact, it was a show that. A, a, a part that I had originated, and that's kind of fun to like walk in and be like. I'm going to show you something you've never seen. Mm -hmm. But like, you know, that can't always happen. Um, one, one of my moms is from a play from the 60s, and it's totally dorky, but people don't do it anymore. Right, so right, it's right. like, I don't know. Um, that's how that happened. But, but, you know, the ones that I was doing before that were stuff that were picked up for me in school. And it was like, this is really right for you. Yeah. And um, I mean, that's, that's an evolution. And, and sometimes you get bored and you need new ones. Mm -hmm. And so one of, like, I, you know, I only have a handful. And I have a new one from a show that I did recently. And then, so that got cycled in. And, mm -hmm. it was, and I tried it somewhere and people were like, <laughs> <laughs> so I only did that once. <laughs> Do you guys um, use backstage here at all, online backstage? Do you, do you guys have agents in Boston? I don't even know if actors have agents. There really aren't any agents in Boston. Uh, and and there's, I haven't found that there's any real use or need for agents in Boston, even in the commercial business. You get a 10% of what? You get like 10% of what? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you get nothing. Uh, going back to the resources, uh, I don't use them much. I've been, I found backstage to be useful if you're if you're between New York and Boston. I find that to be really helpful. Um, but a lot of I feel like backstage is pretty predominantly New York and LA, depending on you know what region you're going in. Yeah. 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 Ye
Hmm. But uh, Playbill, State Source, Equity Website, I think said those are. Yeah, Playbill. Playbill's a, every, usually a, a lot of the mid sized theater companies, you know, the Huntington ART, they always post on Playbill. Um, but a lot of the mid sized companies are doing it too, um, Lyric Speakeasy. I'm signed up with uh, NowHacking.com, which used to be a player's guide or used to be Academy Players Director, or one or the other, I can't remember which. Uh, has moved to online, but I can't get them to stop submitting me for, not submitting me, or sending me notices for, for uh, uh, non-equity African Americans. If you get an equity African American there, give me a call. When did you do those roles? George Lucas! Why are you working for George Lucas? His next movie! So the 1950s. Uh, and you had, you had a question here? Well, yeah, actually, my, mine is not a question, but it's just I'm going to ask about how you guys feel about this. So and I, I want to be sure other people know how it's looking at the monologue. My question is what I heard, that you have to be, you have to be careful. You don't want to accidentally hurt the, the golden edition. You don't want to go in and say profanity. You don't want to say, like, sexuality stuff and put people off. How do you guys, I mean, do you ever go in an audition and did something like that? I would. I never did, but I heard people said they gone in and done. You mean with, with like audition that. monologues? Yeah. Well, that's the thing. Like, oh, the, yeah, the if they're, if you know, if they're. <laughs> I don't think just addressing the. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and fuck are you? Then? <laughs> <laughs> no fucking vibe to do you. <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> Get out of here. There, there aren't that many, there aren't that many places that, that actually ask you to bring in pre-arranged material. Yeah, no, I just, I just, I, I, I had this one guy who went in, and he goes, "This is like obscene," and he said, "We still really upset the director, so go in and try." And next thing I know, I get a director yelling. Yeah, I mean, if it's not appropriate for what you're auditioning for, I mean, if you're a pro, if you're auditioning for something with lots of profanity, you should probably, you know. Do something appropriate. Uh, I think the important thing, like ah, I'm, I'm just aggressive this way. Like, feel awesome about yourself before you go in the room. Like, I, when you watch somebody walk in who is prepared and they they're psyched, like they walk in with a feeling of you haven't seen this yet. You know, like I already yeah. own this. Yeah, I mean, I you already need to be own aggressive. This. Find a way to okay. feel great about about the work that you do. I mean, I, I feel like anything less than that is a waste of time. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's just how I feel. I mean, I, feel I love to audition because that's like I I feel that way. You know. How do you guys feel about like having your like the level of memorization and carrying sides? Because I've heard, like different people feel really differently about this. Because, you know, when I was in school, they're like, go in there, memorized, completely memorized mm -hmm. for this audition. And then other people are like, no, like, have it so you can look at it. Because I, I feel like if you walk in totally, like, you want to know it, really know it. If you, if you have it so memorized, you're like, I don't need these papers. And you, like, walk in and you're like, oh, I just went up. And, like, this is rigidity. Like, what do you guys try to do? I think that there's a, a great value to having the papers in your hand. Mm -hmm. Not only for your own security, but also to remind the people on the other side of the table that this is an audition mm -hmm. right? and not a finished performance. Right. It's, a, it's just a visual reminder. Mm -hmm. and, and even if you don't need to, just glance down at it. To, <laughs> It's, it speaks and to equity rule number eight that there's still an opportunity for the director to give you some direction, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, you're not going in there all yeah. done before you even yeah. start, right? Mm -hmm. I, I think it's I think it's important to have to, to, to just remind them that this is not this is not it's not where I'm this is not my finished product. This is like uh, you know an exploration. Yeah, it's an exploration. Mm -hmm. it's something, if there's something in here that interests you that you know. Bring bring as much as you can to it, but yeah, just like, have it in your hand. And Whether you a, need to refer to it or not, just have it in your hand. It's your first rehearsal, basically, yeah. for yeah. something. And you you know, it's okay to look at your script in first rehearsal. It's it well think of it this think of it that way. As a as a you walk into the first day of rehearsal 
and you do your first table reading. What do you think of the guy that sits there at the table and closes his book and just says all his lines to you, you know? And then like, does it the same way like he's, for the rest of the he's show. Finished work, he's, he's finished working. And, and probably has. If that's, yeah. Because instead of saying, oh, I'm here to explore the words with you, he says, yeah, I, I got it. Yeah. <laughs> And it's never about the words. I see you're still on book. <laughs> <laughs> it's never about the words in an audition. It's always about some sort of relationship that you're creating in a moment. There you go. Mm -hmm. you know? It's really very seldom about the words you know, to discover. I mean, the words, the words are the framework. The words are what you use, but it's not <laughs> about them. And I don't know the words. <clears throat> and it's the same thing with songs, too, I'm finding, like, because I, like, my training was all classical theater, and I'm, just, like, I feel like I'm getting to a point in song that's where it's all washing into the same thing, where you, you know, once you're auditioning at a certain level, everyone sings great, and they don't even care how you sing anymore. Like, you walked in the room, you, you obviously can sing it, so you better be able to create something that's apart from that music, you know? Yeah. You're not there to, to show them how well you can sing. No, that was the first 16 years. You're not there to show them how well you can act. You're there to be. Mm. That's pointy. <laughs> you had a question? Did I say something pointy? <laughs> 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 I have an equity-related question. It's a little mysterious to me. I'm sad, so I understand that equity if you can, I'm assuming you're all equity, so how long did you work non-union stuff and at what point do you become equity? What do you have to do? Like, if anyone can talk about that. That's a tricky one. Everybody's yeah, got personal. a different story. Yeah, yeah. personal. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I, probably the, the most uh, uh, recent equity member probably, and I got my card in 2009, um, and I got turned down from six shows because I got my card, um, which was a little disheartening, but then, you know, someone took a chance and then they had to start hiring you and so on and so forth. But it, it, it's really different, I would say, depending on, you know, when you feel like you're ready to take the plunge because it is like, there aren't as many contracts as you would like, yeah, I think, the, in every house, so. There's usually a, 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 di a, dif a transition period, not not for everybody, but I think for it's hard once you first go and they're kind of like, well, we could just go non-union with this, and that happens for a while. I think for a lot of people, so it's that crazy thing where you get your card and then you don't work, which I didn't quite happen to me, but it happens a lot. Um, it happens a lot, uh, particularly with women, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Something to bear in mind. Uh, is that more true, presumably, in Boston than it would be if you were in New York? I mean, if you were equity and you were in New York, would you be coming up against that problem quite so frequently? Yeah. Same thing. Yeah, it's a workforce yeah. is what, 75% women yeah. or something like that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. is that right? That's wow. And, and with 23% <laughs> <laughs> of the parts. Yeah. yeah. Well, but, parts that are made for men. It's, it's, mm -hmm. I, I feel, in my opinion, I think the card is more useful in New York City. Yeah. yeah. Just yeah, because there's right. just a, a, a better proportion of work, yeah. or a greater proportion of work, I yeah, should say, yeah. for equity houses. Yeah. Um, there's some super cool companies in this town who oh, are yeah. non-equity that I want to work for. Yeah, there's absolutely. nothing I can do about it yeah. anymore. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Same thing in Chicago. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, Chicago is the place where you don't, isn't it? You, you yeah. do Dude, not what are you want doing to it for? Like, I joined <laughs> because I couldn't, like, I didn't care. All I wanted to do was do shows. So I just did shows to shows to shows. And then... I, I just couldn't take watching equity people be treated better, so that was what pushed it over for me. But I did enough work that I felt confident in what it was that I did. You know, I, that was what I. You know, I, th I think you have to trust your own instincts on it uh, as to when when is the time for you to do it. If you're happy working, uh, you're, and you're and you're working, you're you're uh, doing what you love doing getting experience, building a resume, uh, working with all kinds of different people, happy doing it, you probably are not, you don't want to 
join the union because it's gonna it it'll it'll slow you down. It's it's like it's kind of like a bump in the road. Uh, you, you, uh, if you're if you're uh, supposed to continue in the profession, you'll you'll you'll, you'll get over it. But um, you got to trust your own instincts on it. Trust what you want to do. I think that's, a, that's good advice. Anyway, trust what you want to do. It is it is what we want to do that guides us and. And uh, I, th I think somewhere we, we, as a society, we, we kind of got off on this track that, you know, what you want to do is to selfish. Uh, but I think that's the, way we're, that's the way we're built to make our decisions. I think it's the right thing to make our decisions on. What you really want to do, what, is, what does the you want to do? What makes you feel good about yourself? What's the decision that you make? I was talking to somebody else I was worried about it. she accepted the job in the theater and then she got a film offer and then the film offer said, well, uh, you, we're going to need you at this time. And she said, do I, do I back out of the, the production? It's, you know, the dress rehearsal is on Friday. And it's like, so what makes you feel good about who you are and what? In the, in, how you deal with your commitments and what you have said you you are. Make a decision off of that. What makes you feel best about you? I think that's true with you in a, in a question like that. Mm -hmm. Trust yourself. We have time for one more question. Uh, I think I'd put this best. Uh, but basically, like if you're not doing just a lot of work all the time and you get, say you get a call back for something that you've read the script of and it's not really your cup of tea really like it's something you could be in but you're just like well that doesn't that's not really the kind of work I really want to do yeah. but does it look very poorly for you when you turn down those callbacks and things like that like if you're like oh, well I'm going to do something <coughs> else or you could be taking jobs that you kind of don't want to do but they're <coughs> like stipend jobs and stuff that you're like two very valuable little seen, words or, I'm booked <laughs> <laughs> We have time for one more question. <laughs> um, where would you recommend taking um, an acting class? Like, I there's so many places that offer classes, but I want to you know like a good yeah, place. Anyway. I wish I knew. Yeah. Continuing education. Um, Anybody who worked with good people? People that recommend. Yeah. Um, um, Michael Chek Chekhov's After Studio Boston and take that. I know a, a lot of the, uh, there are two big uh, <coughs> casting agencies in Boston that have a lot of training uh, opportunities and classes, Boston Casting and CP Casting. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I've never taken one of their classes, but I get their emails all the time. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if those are geared specifically toward film or just general acting or anything like that. But I mean, one of the things I've, I've tried to do is, like I've worked with actors that I really enjoyed and then I, I would pay them. I, I when I was before I went into grad school, I I was I had no idea what I was doing, so I was just like calling acting teachers and looking up people in New York City and just asking random people questions. And I called Nicholas Cage's acting teacher. I called this woman. I'm like, hi, blah blah. blah you, you know, well, I don't know what I'm doing, and I'm randomly calling people who I don't know. And uh, she says, well, actually, one of my students, Nicholas Cage, is doing very well. And what he did is he found one person that he could learn from, and he trained under that person. You know, like, that's okay, too. I don't know, you know, a lot of actors, if you, if you ask them, like, help me with this. And you want to give them money. They usually don't have money, and they usually have information that they can give you. So. I, I find that there's very, very little communication between actors uh, actors who say to another one another I'm having trouble with this can you help me do you have any ideas do you, can you get me out of this rut can you give me a kick whatever uh, we don't we don't ask each other that I just did that for the first time. It was a big deal. Like I wrote to another actor, and I was like, "You saw this show, and this wasn't working. Let's talk. Can you can you talk to me about it?" And she did, and I was like, "Oh my god! Like we should always be doing that." Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's like one of the first things I did. College, so. <laughs> like I, every time I finished a show, I would I would grill the director. I would grill people. Like,
you got to be aggressive. Be aggressive about what you want to know. You want to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Don't be afraid. Don't make excuses. I think what it, it, it's it's really uh, a shame that we don't do that in in our companies. You know, when we're all, we're all working on the same project, it's like we're not allowed to. You know, and I I I keep trying to make little headway. In, wait, Say something to somebody that'll make them ask me a question, so that I can, so that I can talk. You know, but it it's important. It's so it's so wonderful a thing to have to have actors talking to each other about what they think moments are about, what they think it's. And I don't understand. It's like it's like there's there's some fear of, uh, that oh it'll get out of hand, and that you know. I don't know whether it's directors who feel they'll lose control, or I have experienced that as well. Um, but I, I think it's something that we should, as a as a group, we should. I, I feel continue lucky to reinforce and say, no, I'm going. I'm going to ask yeah. this person because going through Trinity, that was a that was a place where you you're a student, but there's also a resident acting company of actors who will go on forever if you ask them. <laughs> yeah. So so. It was it was very commonplace for us to be like the conservative. There was no real line between where the conservatory ended and where the professional company began. If you were working with the company, because a lot of them were your teachers. So I just always like I still look at people that I work with who I look up to as teachers of mine, because yeah. it was just a natural way of being. That's great. I think uh, I think we're going to end it there, but I hope that you guys will stick around maybe for a few minutes after, so if anybody else has questions, we can mingle about, and then we will um, leave it there. Thank you guys.